Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson 21 of the simple series of my Z80 programming tutorials. We're back on the ZX81 today again and we're going to be looking at actually two things in this lesson because they're both pretty simple. We're going to be looking at drawing bitmap graphics via the block characters. You can see we've got a nice big Chibiko on the right hand side of the screen, that's my mascot there. And we're also going to be looking at reading in the keyboard and moving around a small sprite around the screen and this sprite is basically an 8x8 pixel Ob object that we've made out of 4x4 four four character blocks. Each character block is sort of 2x2 two two pixels if you can consider those huge chunky block pixels. But um, if we look at this example on the left here, if I use QAO and P, we can see a little man can move around the screen and there's some very crude animation there. So that's what we're going to be looking at in today's lesson. We're going to be looking at these two examples and we're going to be looking at the use of those character block graphics that we've used to create this character here. Okay, so how do these character blocks work? Well, using character blocks is exactly the same as drawing any other character to the screen. We've just got a special selection that we want to use. Now, the first half of these are from character zero onwards, so space is one of them, and you can see each of these is using a different combination of the pixels, if you will, on a two by two grid there. So that is the first set there, but that isn't enough for every possible permutation and combination of a two by two black and white grid. Uh, the other part are here at the inverted range here. And so we need to use the combination of these to draw our Chibiko mascot that you can see here. And I've actually, um, outputted them all in sequence, um, or at least in one sequence, as a sort of um, bit combination of four bits there at the bottom of the screen. There's all the 16 characters we needed for every combination, and we'll be seeing the code that does that. Now, if you want to output graphics in the format for today's examples, you can, as always, use my AcroSprite editor. Here's AcroSprite editor. And the option you would need to do to create the examples today is this ZX81 option here and it's just save raw bitmap here and that's in the Z80 menu. Basically, AcroSprite Editor has been programmed with the correct 16 different character combinations. So when you run this and export the file, it will create bytes that are the correct characters you would want to show to your screen to create the graphics you're looking at today. So that's what AcroSprite Editor is offering you to help you out if you want to do this. Now, the um, animated character we've got today is an, on an 8x8 pixel um, grid there. It's an 8x8 pixel sprite. And you can see we've got basically two frames of animation for each direction, left and right there. He's doing a kind of little walking dance there. And then we've got two that we're using for both up and down. So we've got six sprites in total. Each sprite is 8 by 8 pixels. That's 4 by 4 blocks. So each of those sprites is 16 bytes in the basic format that we're using today. Okay, so that's the graphics we're using. And that's what we're going to be looking at. So let's go over to our source code and let's take a look at what we've got today. Okay, so the um, the basic starting point of today's example is essentially the hello world example that we used before. So we've got the same header and footer uh, defining the VRAM and defining the start of the program. So if you need to know how to compile a program, please see the hello world example on the ZX81 and you'll see that. Now, the f what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be drawing two objects to the screen. The first is the sprite and that's the nice big Chibiko you can see here, that's the sprite. And then the second one is the sequence of block characters. And you can see they're all separated by a character 15, which actually appears as a question mark. So that's the block characters there. And that is the sequence that we are showing here. And you can see it's a very logical se sequence. It goes from zero to seven, and then it goes from 87 and then downwards again. So very logical sequence there, much more logical than the pet was. Pet was a little bit confusing for me. So we've basically got two sprites here, if you will. Uh, the first one is the Chibiko character itself, and the second one is the strip along the bottom of the screen that we're going to show. So we have, we're going to create a routine to show a sprite to the screen, and it's unimaginatively called show sprite, because it shows a sprite, surprisingly. Now, we're going to spe specify a few parameters here. HL is going to be the source memory for the sprite. DE is going to be the VRAM destination, so we've got to calculate the memory offset for the XY position we want, and we'll look at that next time. This, this first example, we've just defined it in a, 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 as, a, as a word here, so we've not, we've not got any code to calculate it, but we'll see that in just a moment. And we're defining the width in C, and the width of the first object, the 48 by 48 pixel one, is 24 wide. And then we're specifying the height in B, and that's 24 again, because it's 24, 48 pixels tall, that's 24 character blocks. And then we just call show sprite here. 
So that's how we're drawing the Chibiko. And, and then we're when we're showing our second example with those block characters along the bottom here, well, we're specifying that just here. The block characters is our source. Here's our VRAM destination that's low down in the screen. Um, 33 bytes per line, of course. So 23 times 33 is calculating the Y line. The width is 31 characters and the height is just one character. And then we're using this show sprite routine. How does the show sprite routine work? Well, it's nothing very clever, really. Basically, we've got at the start here, we are backing up B and C here, and then we're backing up D and E. D and E is our screen destination. We're setting B to zero. Now C is, of course, the width. And then we're just using an LDIR, which will transfer one entire line of the sprite. We're then restoring DE. We're adding 33, effectively moving down one line. So we're starting at the left, moving down a line, and then scanning across the line and moving down a line again and scanning across once again. So that's what we're doing there. That's why we're adding 33 there. Each line is 32 characters plus one line feed. That's why it's 33. And then at the end of that, we're restoring BC. Now, if you remember, C was the width of our character and B was the height. And so at this point, we're using a DJNZ and that's just repeating us for the next line of our sprite. So that's how we've shown our Chibico and our test graphics to the screen. Now that's all very well and good, nothing particularly remarkable there. But the second example we've got today is going to actually do a um, reading of the keyboard. And it's called ZX8 Joy, which is totally incorrect because we are reading in from the keyboard. It's because uh, it's for consistency. I usually use the joystick in these kind of examples, but the ZX81 doesn't have one. So we're using QAO and P to simulate a joystick. And if you've seen my tutorials before, you might recognize the code we've got here because it's the um, simple sprite moving example. It's just had a slight tweak for a bit of fun. We're, um, we're showing a small animated character this time. But the first thing we want to discuss is the reading of the controls. So this is going to read in QAOP and also space and enter for fire buttons. Now we don't need any fire buttons in today's example, but you know, I want to, I want to make the example usable in the best way possible for future examples, you know, when we're doing more advanced things later on. Now, how do we read in the keyboard? Well, if you know anything about the ZX Spectrum, then you already know the answer because the ZX Spectrum, I guess, copied its keyboard off the ZX81. It's exactly the same. I literally copied the code straight across and it worked fine. So basically, the ZX81, like the ZX Spectrum, uses 16-bit ports. So when we do an in command, it's actually the BC combination that is the port that is read in from. And we, um, we exploit this, if you will, when we read in from the keyboard. Basically, we set C to FE and then we set B to whatever line we want to read in. And basically all the bits need to be one except a single bit niche needs to be zero. And depending on the position of that bit is that zero bit is the line we're going to read in. And we will get a sequence of keys in bit zero to four of the result. And each of those keys will relate to the various keys on the keyboard. And if the result in that bit is a zero, the key is held down. If it's a one, the key is not pressed. So that's how we read in our keyboard, and that's what we're going to do here. And so basically what we're going to do is we're going to start with C equals FE, and we're going to set B to zero and then seven ones, and that will read in the line with space. And we're going to shift bit zero out of the result, and we're going to store that in a register that will build up. We're then going to shift that zero along one, and we're going to test again, and that will get us the enter key in bit zero. We then shift again, and that will get us the P key, We'll then shift again, and that will get us the OP. We then skip over this one because we don't want any of the digits in this example. We then shift again, and we'll get the Q and the A later on. And then we're going to combine these into a resulting byte, which will give us basically the sequence where bit zero is up, bit one is down, bit two is left, and bit three is right, and then bit four will be fire, and bit five would be a second fire, which will be space and enter. Now, we're not actually going to use the fires today, but we are going to use the up, down, left and right, which you can see we're testing bits zero to three there. So that's what we're going to be doing in today's example. And you can see the code here that does that for us. So basically what we're doing here is we're loading B with that initial sequence with the zero at the far left in bit seven. We load C with FE because remember when we do an in from port C, we're actually using B and C combined. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to get all of those bits in. So first of all, we're reading in a byte from the BC pair port there. We're then shifting bit zero out and into H. H is our build up. So basically that's going to be the result at the end of this routine. We're then shifting one bit to the right here for the register B, and that is effectively changing the line of the keyboard we're reading. So we read in space. We're then going to read in N2 and P. 
You can see here we've got a loop here, we're looping this three times. So we're reading in the space, then the enter, then the P and then the O here. That's what we're doing there. We're shifting them each time into H here. But then after we've got left, what we need to do next is we actually need to skip a bit. And that's because we don't want anything from this line here. We don't want any of the numbers there. So we're skipping over there. We're then loading in another bit. And this time we're getting Q, which is going to be our key for up. But what we actually wanted to read in is the down key next. So that's from the next line along. So we're moving that into L for now as a temporary register there. We're shifting along again and we're now getting our down key. We're then shifting that into H and then we're shifting in the up key that we got before into H as well. And so now at this point, H now contains the built up combination. So bit zero is up, bit one is down, bit two is left and bit three is right, bit four is fire one and bit five is fire two if we want to use them. So that's what we've now got in H and the accumulator. And so that's what we're going to use. Now, we've got this little cute animation thing here where our character can kind of walk around. And this is basically done by um, calculating a sprite position. So basically, we've got a binary file, which is all of our sprites combined, or six of them. And we're going to need to calculate an offset within those. Each of the sprites is 16. So to calculate the offset, we're going to want sprite number times 16. And that will calculate which one of the sprites we want to show for the frame of animation and also the direction the character is moving. So we've got some variables to work with that for us. Basically, we've got a few here. So we've got an X and a Y position. Those are the current player positions. A last X and Y position, that's used for restoring the position when the player goes off the screen. And then we've got frame number and we've got frame base. And these two are added together and used as the offset for the memory address of the source bitmap data for our sprite. Now, basically, when we're moving our character around the screen here, we are storing the X position in B and the Y position in C here throughout the sequence. And what we're doing here is we're testing each of the directions. If the up key is not pressed, then we skip over this part here. If the up key is pressed, then we're decreasing the C, which is the Y position moving up the screen effectively. And we're changing the frame base to four here, which means we're going to be starting from sprite four. We're gonna use sprites four and five for the up animation. The down is very similar. We're testing the down bit there in our um, key presses. We're then setting the sprite to four again because we're actually using the same animation for up and down. We don't have a different one. This time though, we're increasing C moving down the screen. So again, we're using four and five sprites there. If the player is moving left, then we are going to decrease B. The B is the X position. And we're setting the frame base to two. We're using sprites two and three for movements to the left. Movements to the right, we're increasing B and we're using the sprites zero and one here. So zero to five are our sprites that we have available to us. Now, at the end of all this, we're flipping the frame number. This is the frame of animation. We're using these two combined together. So the frame number is always zero or one and frame base is the pair of sprites that we're using for our character's animation. Let me just close that so we can see the one that we're using. So it, when we're moving around, we're toggling between the two frames of animation there. That's how we're working. So we've now updated our sprites as needed and moved our player around the screen. But what we need to do is we need to make sure our player can't go off the screen because we'd, uh, we'd end up writing to off VRAM and cause horrendous crashes. So that's what we're going to do next. Basically, what we're doing here is we're checking the boundaries. We're loading in the X position, comparing to 30. And if we're not below 30, then we are resetting the player position. We're using the original backup version to restore the player's position here. Now, we are only testing the upper boundary because the lower boundary is zero. And if you go below zero, you wrap around to 255, which would actually be higher anyway. So if you've gone below zero, the negative numbers would effectively also be caught by these checks here. So we're keeping our player on the screen there. The final thing we're doing here is we're drawing the new sprite to the screen. And then we've got a short delay just to make sure things don't run too fast. And then we're repeating. So how are we drawing our sprite to the screen? Well, the first thing is we've actually got a, a fake sprite here. We've got a blank sprite, and this is just a piece of white space. It's just 16 zero bytes here, and it's effectively a sprite that clears away the old position. So that's what we've got there. Our proper one though is this draw player routine here. We're loading our sprite base here, and this is the export from Aku Sprite Editor. This is it here. This is the Aku Sprite Editor export. So this is in the correct um, format one byte per block that will be just what we need to dump straight to the screen. It's already in the correct format there. 
So what we need to do is we need to calculate the frame, frame number offset to our sprite base here. So we're loading in DE from frame number. Now frame number and frame base are consecutive bytes in memory. So when we load DE and E together, we're actually getting both of them. So we've now got both of those in D and E. So all we're doing here is we're adding D and E together and then we want to multiply those by 16 because there's 16 bytes for each of our sprites in our character animation. And so all we're doing is we're doing a sequence of bit shifts to the left here where each one effectively multiplies by two. So all of those together effectively multiply by 16. We add that to the base in HL and we've now calculated the correct source address for the frame of animation we want. We've also got a function called get screen pause here. Now this is exactly the same, I think, as the one in the um, Hello World example. We'll have a look at it in just a moment though. And then we've got the exact same show sprite routine we just saw in the previous example showing that giant Chibiko. It's just the same code. We're just setting a fixed width and height here of four here. And it's that get screen pause that has calculated the destination VRAM address. And here's the code that's done that. Now, our video RAM, if we just have a look at the bottom of our file here, starts with a new line character and each line is 32 bytes, but also ends in a new line character. So we need to basically start from VRAM plus one, which we've done there. We need to add our X position because each, um, each block across the screen is a single byte. So we're adding our X position here, but then we need to multiply our Y position by 33. Now that's not so easy to do in some ways, but it's kind of easy if we do it in the right way. So what we're basically going to do is we're going to break that up. We're going to add the Y pos times one, and then we're going to add the Y pos times 32. And those two together will make 33 and it will be a nice fast operation there. So we're loading E with C here. That's the Y position. D was already zero. And then we're adding DE to HL. So that's added the Y pos times one. We're then bit shifting to the left repeatedly, effectively multiplying by 32 here. And then we're adding that again. So we've added Y pos times 32. We've also added Y pos times one. And so we've effectively calculated the Y pos times 33. And that's how we're able to calculate the memory address to draw our sprite to from an X and Y position. So there we go. So that's um, all we're covering today. A nice, simple example, I think, but a very practical one. Now, if you want, of course, go to my website, download today's example and use it in any way you can in your own games and projects. That's what it's there for. Now, the ZX81, I don't believe, had any kind of sound capabilities. I'm not aware any was ever added to it. So um, I, I'm kind of thinking that if you are wanting to get started on simple games, this should be a really quite um, quite decent starting point for you being as you've got graphics and you've got key input and um, you know, I say with Acus Sprite Editor you can get from my website which is also free you can um, you can build your own graphics for it so maybe you can create some little games for it anyway um, go to my website get all the stuff and have some fun with it hope you like what you've seen today if you have please like and subscribe thanks for watching today and goodbye